Hello, and welcome to worship at Dunwoody United Methodist Church. My name is Kathy Brockman, and I am one of the pastors here. We're delighted that you have chosen to join us this day, and we'd like to know more about you, especially if you're worshiping with us for the first time. You'll see the link for our Connect card on the screen below. If you'll take just a minute to complete it for us, we'll know that you've joined us today. For anyone who wants to know more about the United Methodist Church, what we believe, and to obtain more information on Dunwoody UMC in particular, we have something just for you. Next Sunday at 10 a.m. in the church parking lot, we will have Discover UMC, and we'll talk about those things and we'll help you get involved. If you need more information, you can call the church office. And now, my friends, let us worship God. For centuries, the Church has used the Apostles' Creed as our affirmation of faith, or what we say we believe. Let us join together now in reciting this historic creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, 
and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. As we come to this time of prayer, you will find the complete list of the concerns and celebrations of our community on the church website. Today, we lift the following families to your attention and ask that you keep them in your prayers this week. We extend our Christian sympathy to Brad and Angela and Brian and Kirsten Beard on the death of Brad and Brian's father, Andy Beard, on January the 13th. Grandfather to Adeline, Ellis, Ander, Sarah, and Ashlyn. We also lift Leanne and Rob Drawn on the death of her mother, Beverly Jennings Parker, on January the 14th. Grandmother to Caroline and Kate. We offer our Christian sympathy to the family and friends of Ruth Manning. She is the surviving spouse of Reverend Norman Manning, who served here at Dunwoody. She died on January the 13th. And we also lift to you Rachel and Alan Whitaker on the death of Rachel's father, David Edmondson, on January the 20th. Now let us go to God in a time of prayer. Holy God, you are the God above and beyond all things. With trust, hope, and humility in our hearts and minds, we gather to praise and worship you, the God who always hears and answers our prayers. O oh Lord, forgive us when we seek to place blame rather than working together to find a solution to our problems. We are a fractured nation, O oh God, and we need to heal those wounds of division. Forgive us for our complicity and our contributions to those divisions through our words, and our deeds. We pray today for our nation's leaders. Give them wisdom to know how best to respond to the needs of the people and give them the courage to do the right thing, even when that may not be popular. Loving God, bring stillness to our hearts and direct our thoughts to those who especially need our prayers. Those who are struggling with this ongoing pandemic, with loneliness, isolation, and depression. We lift those who have lost employment during this time and those who struggle to make ends meet. We pray also for all the frontline workers who have given of themselves for so long now. Oh God, help us to know and remember those who feel they have struggled against life's difficulties and disappointments alone and uncared for. Help us to also remember those who endure hardship in this life even without the pandemic, especially those experiencing homelessness or living in poverty, those suffering from addiction or mental illness. We pray, loving God, for those who are ill or in the hospital. We pray for those experiencing a deep sense of loss and grief because of the death of loved ones. Strengthen us, loving God, to be your hands, feet, and heart in this world, always seeking to do that which you call us to do. Hear us now as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We 
are very fortunate at Dunwoody UMC to have many ministry groups that your donations support. Our Stephen ministers are one of those valuable ministries. We have a dedicated group of extensively trained volunteers to walk beside you during some of the trying times in life. And we have certainly been and continue to go through some difficult times. These men and women who have trained to be Stephen ministers commit to confidentially meeting weekly with anyone who expresses a desire to meet with them. If you or someone you know would like more information, please call Pat DeBolt at the number below or contact the church office. God spoke to me a hundred times before my name I would not go. Now I cry with joy on bended knee, but a bend is happy long ago. such a tricky thing. My mother says you start to feel your age when you don't feel well. We tend to think of people we've not seen in a while as the age they were when we last met them. Well, at least I do. My picture of Betty White is as a golden girl. 
But you probably know that Betty White turned 99 this week. If he had lived, Martin Luther King Jr. would have been celebrating his 92nd birthday this week, and Anne Frank would have only been 91. Does that give you some perspective? In fact, John Belushi would have been 72 years old today. Can you believe that? For me, people are frozen in the time we lost them, aren't they? You remember Jake and Elwood, the Blues Brothers, who famously said, they're not going to catch us. We're on a mission from God. Are you on a mission from God? I have been fiercely studying Jonah for the last several weeks, looking at the mission God sent him on, and I've been so busy looking at Jonah that I missed the message from this week's text. I was heading in the wrong direction, yet the Holy Spirit revealed this interpretation to me. It happens, doesn't it? We spend days and weeks focused on the wrong thing, headed in the wrong direction, and God nudges us to get back on track. When we think we have it all under control, doing it our way, God tends to nudge us back. And when we are confronted with our shortcomings, those times we've fallen short from doing it our way, we have several excellent excuses, don't we? In the Blues Brothers movie, when Jake Blues doesn't show up when he's supposed to, he's confronted with his shortcomings and he runs through a series of excuses for why he is not to blame. I ran out of gas. I had a flat tire and enough money for a cab fare. My tux didn't come back from the cleaners. An old friend came in from out of town. Someone stole my car. There was an earthquake, a terrible flood, locusts. It wasn't my fault, I swear. In our text for today, Jonah was sent on a mission from God. But Jonah had other ideas. So I invite you to hear these words from the first chapter of Jonah, verses 1 to 16. We'll get to verse 17, but for now, let's examine this part of the story. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. And so he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried to his God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. The captain came and said to him, What are you doing sound asleep? Get up! Call on your God. Perhaps the God will spare us a thought so that we do not perish. The sailors said to one another, Come, let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? I am a Hebrew, Jonah replied. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them so. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it's because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the boat back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. 
Then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made their vows. This is the good news according to Jonah. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, may your word come to us this day. Help us to head in the direct direction that you've called us to go. Lord, give us direction. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, whose name means dove. He was obviously a flight risk. The word from the Lord was not a word Jonah wanted to hear. Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. Sometimes I think that is how we know it's a word from the Lord, because time and time again in my life, God pushed me in a direction that I might not have chosen for myself. Has that ever happened to you? You felt a nudge or a push or even a shove in a direction, but your preference would have been to go the other way? God has come to Jonah with urgent instructions. Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up to me like some unpleasant odor. Can you smell their wickedness? You see, Jonah hated the Ninevites, and for good reason. The Ninevites had wreaked havoc on his people, the northern kingdom of Israel. The people of Nineveh, part of the Neo-Assyrian Neo Empire, were known for their brutality in war, for the atrocities they left in their wake. They celebrated their viciousness. And if Jonah had not seen that firsthand, he had certainly heard the stories about it from the survivors. There was no place Jonah wanted to go less than Nineveh. So I invite you to take a moment to think about the people you struggle with the most. You got someone? I suspect they are your Ninevites. We all have people we struggle with, don't we? How could they not see the world just like we do? Don't they understand? Maybe they live in a faraway place, or maybe they even live in your own home. Perhaps they're much younger than we are. Or maybe they're much older than we are. We just can't believe that they don't agree with us and see things our way. Now, it may be someone you never met that you struggle with. Or maybe it's that family member who you just don't see eye to eye with. They might be your Ninevite today. For we seem to live in a day where everything has a side. You are either with me or against me. This is how Jonah thought about the Ninevites. They were his sworn enemies. Do you have your Ninevites in mind today? Could it be that the people God wants you to reach out to are the people you least want to reach out to? For you see, God told Jonah, your assignment is to go to the people whom you dislike the most. Your assignment, Jonah, should you choose to accept it, is to speak to the Ninevites on my behalf. And Jonah can think of few things worse, even though his role is to cry out against their wickedness. Now that doesn't seem so bad, does it? Crying out against other people's wickedness? I kind of like that part. Holding them accountable, holding others accountable, calling others out for their inconsistencies, for where their positions break down, for where their logic just doesn't hold up. We love calling other people to account, don't we? Amen? But Jonah the prophet sees into the future. He sees beyond that call to accountability, and he seems to be thinking to himself, what if the Ninevites do change? What if they actually repent? Then I would have to welcome them. I would have to welcome them as a part of the covenant people of God, and that sounds awful. I would rather die than welcome those people. And he begins to plan his escape. God says, you need to go up to Nineveh. And Jonah sets out in the opposite direction. Jonah goes down to Joppa, the exact opposite way. God, you want me to go to the northeast? I'm going to the southwest. In Jonah's day, people thought that God was tied to a place. Yahweh was the God of Israel and Judah, and if God is tied to a place, God couldn't be everywhere, so Jonah could escape him. Jonah is supposed to be on a mission from God, but instead he runs away, thinking he can escape God. And thus starts Jonah's downward spiral. He goes down to Joppa, down in the belly of a ship, down into sleep, down, 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 
And while he sleeps there in the belly of the ship, there is a storm raging above, and the sailors on the boat seem to be overwhelmed by this storm. You remember, the weather started getting rough, the tiny ship was tossed, if not for the courage of the fearless crew. Wait, that's the wrong story. This storm is so bad that the seasoned sailors are afraid, afraid that their ship is going to break apart. Have you ever been in such a storm in your life? A storm so bad that you feared things would break apart? Some of us might feel like we're in a storm like that today. Worried things in our world might break apart. Things in our lives might break apart. We're so thankful that many of you are getting the vaccines, but others are still worried. These are seasoned sailors, and they shouldn't be afraid, but they are. Now, sailors are not always known for their faithfulness. You rarely hear the phrase, well, he prays like a sailor, cusses like a sailor maybe, but prays like one? I'd been so immersed in Jonah's journey that I missed the transformation of the sailors. They knew from the beginning that something wasn't right. This was not their first sea crossing. This was no ordinary storm, and they recognized it. They recognized the problem was bigger than they, they were. Their lives had become unmanageable there in the storm. And after studying and studying this text, I finally took notice to what the sailors did. I was so busy looking at Jonah that I missed it. The sailors are so afraid that each cried out to their own God for help. They called upon their higher power when things got unmanageable. When we find ourselves in a storm, that's a pretty good first step. Acknowledging the problem and crying out for help, asking for help. After that time of crying out, the sailors begin to do all they can to deal with their problem. They even start to throw all their cargo overboard. They lighten their load. Friends, when the storms of life are raging, there may be some baggage that you are carrying some extra cargo that it is time to let go of. You don't need to carry that anymore. They do all that they can, but it doesn't seem to be working. And all the while, Jonah, the reluctant prophet, is sleeping soundly there down in the belly of the ship. I remember when I was about 12 years old, we were visiting San Francisco, and I got to be the navigator on that trip. Back in the days before GPS, I loved a good map. Do you remember maps? Maps that you could actually fold up and unfold? My navigation got us safely out of the Bay Area, and we were headed down Pacific Coast Highway, US-1. There were cliffs to the left and the ocean to the right, and we were in a large rented van that the driver was unfamiliar with. Every curve made me more and more uneasy. My brain was overwhelmed. All I could do was fall asleep. I woke up several hours later. And maybe that's why Jonah can sleep in this huge storm. The stress got to be too much, so his body gave him the gift of sleep. The leader of the sailors looks at Jonah, asleep in the belly of the boat, and he appeals to, them, to him, yelling over the wind and the waves, what are you doing sound asleep? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will spare us a thought so that we do not perish. The sailors have prayed. They've thrown cargo overboard to lighten their load, and now their leader appeals to their passenger to get up and pray. When you're in a storm, that's a pretty good tactic. Ask someone who doesn't seem to be affected by the storm to pray for you. But Jonah doesn't pray, friends. Jonah doesn't call on God in that storm. Jonah, who is supposed to be speaking for God, remains silent. Even though he already knew God and had a relationship with God, he was not willing to pray for himself or for others. You see, it's tough to pray to a God that you're running away from. Then the camera shifts topside back to the deck where the sailors are trying to figure out just whose fault this storm is. They've prayed, they've gotten rid of extra baggage, they have asked another to pray for them, and when all that doesn't seem to work, their thoughts turn to blaming. There in the midst of the storm, waves crashing, wind wailing, the boat rocking and creaking, I'm seasick just thinking about it. And they start asking questions, which is normal. We ask questions when things seem out of control, and their first question is, who is to blame for this storm? 
because there's always more than enough blame to go around, isn't there? Winston Churchill, who died on this day back in 1965, wisely said this, take the blame when it's your mistake. If you are honest and right, then you'll have very few apologies to give. Why is it the more anxious people become, the more they want to hurl blame on others? It's been happening since the beginning of time. We've been good at blaming. It's not my fault she gave me the forbidden fruit. It's not my fault the serpent tricked me. It's not my fault I ran out of gas. There were locusts and earthquake. In every crisis, people look for someone else to blame. For blame allows us to project our problems out there. So the sailors cast lots to see who is to blame. Some would see that as a game of chance, but in the ancient world, it was a way of discerning what the divine wanted. So in a way, the sailors are looking to God for discernment. We see that in the book of Acts, remember? As they cast lots to find a disciple to replace Judas, the sailors cast lots. And Jonah pulls the short straw. He is to blame. There's no question about that. He's the one trying to flee from his God, for he has told them that's why he was on the boat in the first place. Have you ever been in a storm like that, where the seas of life are raging all around you, and rather than working to fix things, you look for someone to blame? We see it happen a lot. Rather than taking responsibility for our role in whatever it is, we hurl blame and accusations. The sail sailors in this story have that normal human reaction, placing blame. But then I discovered they work a through a process to break through that blame. I was so worried about Jonah that I missed it. Jonah makes it back up to deck where the sailors confront the bleary-eyed Jonah with a barrage of questions. And the first one is this, what is your occupation? Now that's pretty funny, y'all. The first thing they ask him is, what is your occupation? And it happens to the best of us. When we're anxious, when we're in a storm, when all we could think of is, we start to ask questions. We, often our first questions are not the best questions. Remember their first question, who is to blame? And then they move on to what is Jonah's occupation? They are on a boat that is about to break apart in a raging sea and their first question is about his LinkedIn profile. Show us your resume, what is your occupation? Now what I really think is going on here is they're reminding Jonah of who he is. All four questions do that. They want him to admit that he's supposed to be on a mission from God, that his occupation is prophet. They wanna remind him of who he is called to be because then they ask, where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? Who are you? They want to jog his memory. Don't you remember? You are the one called by God. Then they finally ask, how can we make this stop? How can we calm the waters? Where is the one at that time who can shout, peace be still, even the wind and the waves obey him? Jonah does not answer their questions about his occupation, nor does he exactly answer about his country of origin, but he does tell them who his people are, and he tells them about the God he worships. Jonah yells, I am a Hebrew. He yells into the storm, I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to Jonah, what is this that you've done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, fleeing from the service of the Lord because he told them so. The book of Jonah pushes the Hebrew people to expand their worldview. They were blessed to be a blessing. The book shows them that the God they worship is the God of each and every one of us, no matter which side of the aisle we may sit on. John F. Kennedy put it this way years ago, let us not seek the Republican answer or the Democratic answer, but the right answer. Let us not seek to fix the blame for the past, let us accept our own responsibility for the future. Let us not seek to fix the, bl fix the blame for the past. Let us accept our own responsibility for the future. Like three former presidents who gathered this week, where did they gather? At a cemetery among the honored dead at the Memorial Amphitheater at Arlington National. 
to urge unity in these stormy days as we seek not to fix blame for the past, but together accept our responsibility for the future. The sailors ask the more sensible question now, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? A better question that's what happens. We start asking questions about the storms we are in. We often start with questions that are not all that helpful, and over time, we start ans asking better questions. And that's how we break through blame. Whether it is our tendency to blame others or our tendency to blame ourselves without, cost, without cause, we ask questions, and then we begin to refine those questions. It happened to me in Disciple Bible Study. Does God ever give you any more than you can handle? And we refine the question to say that life gives each of us more than we could ever handle alone. And that's part of Jonah's problem. He's been trying to handle things alone because the sea was growing more and more tempestuous as if the sea was ready to break the boat apart even more. And Jonah puts the burden back on the sailors. He says to them, pick me up, throw me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it's because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Jonah takes blame, but not responsibility. Jonah seems willing to take the blame for their struggle. It was me, my bad, but he doesn't take responsibility. In our Bible study Wednesday night, someone pointed out that if Jonah knows he's the problem, why doesn't he just jump out of the boat to save the sailors? To take responsibility, he would not have had to sacrifice himself. He could have just prayed to his God to stop the storm, or he could have turned and set his face in the direction that God wanted him to go. Instead, he puts the burden back on the sailors. Jonah tells them that what they can do to save themselves. They can sacrifice Jonah's life, and then one of my favorite things in the story happens. The text tells us that the sailors rowed even harder to get the boat back to shore. I learned a lot from the sailors this week. When they were in trouble, they prayed. They cried out to their higher power. They got rid of extra baggage. They asked another to intercede for them, and they tried to discern God's intention. They asked questions and then asked better questions. And now confronted with an answer they couldn't live with, they worked even harder to try and save the life of the one who was causing their life to be in such a storm. It happens all the time. Someone in our life has made a decision to go in the opposite direction that God would have them to go. You've seen it. And that causes a storm to rage around your family, your company, your church. Have you ever experienced that? Sometimes we're the ones to blame for the storm as we ourselves have decided to go in the opposite direction that God intends. Sometimes we're experiencing the storm because someone in our lives think that their decisions are only affecting them. They may be sleeping in the boat, but we feel the impact of the storm that their decisions have caused. In fact, their decisions bring a storm upon everyone on board with them, and they don't always see it. The sailors didn't want to have to hurt someone in order to save themselves. They were good, hard-working folks, so they rowed even harder, but they had hauled in that deadly catch. They were unwilling to toss Jonah overboard without trying everything they could. They showed their faithfulness, their goodness, their patience. They showed the fruit of the Spirit, everything in their power to save everyone, including Jonah. They did everything they could. Yet all their rowing efforts didn't make a difference because the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Three times now the storm has gotten worse and worse. And in spite of himself, Jonah converts a whole boat of sailors. They start praying to Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews. No longer are they praying to their own gods. They begin to pray to Yahweh, Please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us feel guilty of innocent blood. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. And with that prayer, they show their trust in God, the God of the universe. They know that God is God and they are not. They have tried to be in control. They've tried to take responsibility for themselves and for Jonah, but finally the sailors picked Jonah up to throw him into the sea. The rabbi suggested that the sailors went to the greatest lengths they could to avoid tossing him in the water. 
They speculate that they first dipped him into his knees and the storm stopped. They breathed a sigh of relief and pulled Jonah out again. And then the storm began again in full force as soon as, Jonah, as soon as Jonah's feet cleared the water. The sailors dipped him into his waist and out again, then to his shoulders and out again. And each time the storm would stop as long as Jonah was in the water. But the storm raged again as soon as they would take him out. Finally, there was nothing the sailors could do but to throw Jonah in. They threw him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. I'd always seen that as a self-serving act, but in my study this week, it feels more like an act of trust. They are giving this person who will not make good decisions for themselves, they are giving this person back into God's love and care. They throw him overboard as an act of faith. You are God and we are not. You are God and this is your servant. We get it now, God, and we'll trust you to do what you will with your servant, Jonah, for you are God and we are not. Because after they throw him overboard, after they let go of the one who is bringing the storm into their life, trusting him to God's love and care, their relationship with God deepens. The sailors feared the Lord even more and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. For you see, God even uses Jonah's disobedience to change the lives of a group of sailors. And we hear the prayers of the newly converted who have broken through their need to blame and move to praise and sacrifice and commitment. If you're trying to break through blame this week, I invite you to follow in the footsteps of these newly converted sailors. Let me just review. You cry out for help when you need it. You let go of whatever is dragging you down. You ask others to pray for you. You ask questions, you listen to the answers, and then you refine your questions. You focus more on the issue and less on who is to blame. You ask questions that call people to live into their best selves. You work as hard as you can to help solve the problem. You cry out to God in prayer, and then you trust that God will respond and be willing to give people who you love into the, uh, who are causing the storms in your life over to the sea of God's love and care. Making sacrifices in response to God's deliverance is what they do next. And then finally, they make vows. They make promises to help others on the journey and to be more discerning about who you have on your boat. The sailors learned an important truth in this process. The opposite of blame is not responsibility. The opposite of blame is forgiveness. It's a good lesson at any age. May we be known not as those who hurl blame, but as those who offer forgiveness. Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Reclothe us in our rightful mind, in pure lives thy service find. In deeper reverence pray.
Now on to verse 17. But the Lord provided. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah. And that was the answer to the sailors' prayers, not to Jonah's prayers. Jonah has remained silent. And now Jonah is in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And that is when Jonah finally prays. I want to invite you to read chapter 2 as your prayer this week. As we prepare for Jonah to be hurled from the big fish onto the beach back toward Nineveh, as we get ready to hear Jonah preach the world's shortest sermon. May we, like Jonah, when we are in over our heads, lift a prayer of thanksgiving, saying with the voice of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. And while we take responsibility, may we continually offer forgiveness where it is needed. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.